War. War never changes. Except when it's the Vietnam War, which in that case is constantly changing with chemicals and weapons and all that good jazz. Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to of course another episode of America Month, where we take a look at Napalm Blues. Napalm Blues being a sort of Kaiserreich, or at least it would be. In fact, it's based on the Heroes of Honor, Hero, Hearts of Iron uh, mythos, as well as a few other ones that I saw in the story. I read all the chapters up to the point, up to this point, which uh, is actually kind of cool. The author himself does have a Discord, and is even part of the other author's Discord that I am personally in. So if you guys want to join that Discord, link will be in the description down below. However, here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. This fanfiction is an Argate fanfiction, but it's set in the Vietnam, a sort of alternate history Vietnam era where Bobby Kennedy is president. And while, yes, that may seem weird to a lot of people, it's honestly not. And I'll be honest, it does have its rough spots, but before I get into it, let's just go ahead and read some nice behind-the-scenes stuff that the author actually sent. And I did ask him about some stuff that I think a lot of you may be asking as well, if you haven't actually read this, but you read the other Vietnam story, The Fight We Chose, which kind of started this whole thing. Uh, but let's just get to it. So I kind of asked him some stuff, and uh, this is what he basically said. From U.S. Napalm Man, his Discord name, First, I actually wrote most of the chapters very late at night. It is kind of obvious from some grammatical errors here and there. Only small nitbit ones, like some, actually some uh, words being misspelled, or some sentences having one word when it should have the other. Uh, but I don't hold it against him, because again, I myself have had some late night edits well into the dawn of editing videos actually staying up all night, pulling all-nighters, and getting very little sleep editing videos, so I know perfectly what you're going through, man, what you went through. Second, most of the chapters are very, are way too short. I'm still learning how to extend them, and that's not a bad thing. The big thing about, of course, the author who does not only of Freedom Rings, but also the fight we chose, is... He does a lot of detail into his stories. Yours feels like an action film, or at least a military action flick. And I hold no ill will against that. In reality, it's actually well written. And before a lot of you start jumping down my throat, ta saying, why do I let that slide if I'm a little bit hesitant on the Gate Wasteland one with its short chapters? Well, the Gate Wasteland one doesn't need short chapters. It needs more chapters since we're talking about Fallout. But with alternate history fiction, especially alternate history crossover fan fiction, it has to have a fine balance, and the author has found a fine balance with the short chapters as is. I was engrossed in each one and kept wanting to click to the next chapter button, uh, sort of like a Netflix show. And that's the best way to describe it, is it's sort of like a good Netflix show, or a good streaming show, where you want to binge this, and you want to keep going, even if it's short or long. Uh, sort of like uh, a Gretzko, where even though the episodes are somewhat short, the story is engaging and fun. I know that's kind of a big comparison to compare this fanfiction to a Gretzko, but I'm talking about in terms of length and sort of uh, being able to engross yourselves in. So, yeah, let's continue on what he had to say. When asked about his favorite chapter, he had this to say. I don't really have a favorite chapter, my inspiration, which, <clears throat> I don't really have a favorite chapter. Okay, but I asked him about his inspiration, and his, and, well, this is what he had to say about inspiration. My inspiration came from the lack of the New Order fanfiction, uh, so I took it upon myself to write one and decided to cross it over with Gate, which was actually kind of nice. And then I asked if he knew about the fight we chose, which of course is another Gate, a Vietnam Gate fanfiction that is written once again very well by the author, uh, by another author who 
I may get these people on a Discord call and live stream. I don't know. I'm, I'm seeing what I can do in terms of balance here, folks. Actually, I have, and I've spoken to the author. He gave me some very good advice for writing. And that's awesome. And that's about it. So, with that little bit of behind-the-scenes stuff out of the way, let's go ahead and get to the fight we chose. Well, not the fight we chose, my bad. Napalm Blues, and see where the story takes place, and more or less how it compares to the fight we chose in terms of a Vietnam story. The, the actual chapter itself, or at least the story, opens up in South Africa, in the African campaign, in the 1960s, where the Nazi, or the Greater German Reich, is still in charge. And there were a lot of things compared to uh, the New Order, as well as the Man in High Castle, and it was actually really nice. The whole story opens up on the fact of, uh, on the 101st Airborne, or at least a team of the 101st, going in, kicking Nazi ass, as well as the Afrika Korps ass, as well as the uh, colonial of Amok ass. Except when the gate opens up, things aren't actually as good as the legionaries who came in there thinking, you know what, we're going to go ahead and conquer and enslave people, instead came to the fucking war. Uh, they were gunned down easily, burned to death, and those who did escape, escaped spreading stories about what the hell happened here. And the Americans, of course, captured a few of them, and the CIA, being the CIA in the 1960s, did what the CIA does best, and makes people talk. Of course! I'm not going to continue on that, ladies and gentlemen, because, uh... Well, I don't want to disappear. Nor do I want to end up on a watch list somewhere, although I probably am on a watch list in some blue states, but... That's neither here, that's neither here nor there. <clears throat> Continuing on, this is where things get a little bit more fun. And I say fun, not fucky-wucky, as uh, was in, of course, uh, Freedom Rings. I say fun because it really was fun. The story opened up. It just got bigger. It, it, it opened up to a lot of cool stuff. It's There's a lot to get into it, but I'm trying to keep this video under 40 minutes. I don't want to go over this, but each chapter, like I said, is short, but each one is entertaining. So I'm only going to go on the key points and sort of how it uh, handles the plot of the actual anime. And it handles the plot very well, especially when the JSDF actually are listening in on the radios. They're a little cautious when the Americans come in. And when the Americans do come in, well, let's just say that when the counterattack happened at their hill, not all on this hill, yes, this is a Gate fanfiction about the two separate hills angle, like many others that did crossovers with Gate. Um, it... <laughs> there is a moment where the 101st Airborne's main character, John, not John from Rambo. No, uh, this John is more or less kind of pissed that his buddy gets hit, which has the pig, uh, the M60. And so he decides to pull a Rambo, pick up the gun, and start unleashing hell. And literally becomes known as uh, a beast of a man, or, or, or this sort of demon, this, this mythos about him. And it does add into the story. It's not just the throwaway line. It does legit add to the story. It does add to the plot. And that is something I definitely do love about this author, is he does add to the plot. He doesn't try to take away from it. He doesn't try to divert it too much. He plays it somewhat safe, but at the same time adds to it. And that's what I fucking love. And the fact that he did take some cues from uh, the author of The Fight We Chose and Freedom Rings definitely shows in this fiction, and I am loving it. The big thing about uh, this whole thing is that now they're in a cult, is that they had to differentiate between the Japs, or the Nips, uh, against uh, the Japanese of the modern era, or 2011-2010, uh, which, that is a big st stipulation between the different fictions and Gates, is that they, they go from 2010 to above. Um, yeah, just, just, just one of those things. You know how it is. The big thing about this fiction that I really do love is the combat. The combat is well done, especially when the Italica siege happens, and instead of just fighting brigands or bandits or rogue soldiers, they're also fighting members of the SS. They're also fighting Krauts. They're fighting Nazis. And it is good. Because Princess Pina Colada and the Japanese start seeing, from the princess's point of view, uh, <laughs> my bad, I need to finish that sentence. They start seeing the, the different angles of combat, and we see their different angles. For the JSDF, they start seeing war crimes left and right. Flamethrowers, napalm. It's insane for them to see these people actually doing this. 
for Princess Pina Colada. <laughs> I'm still not going to go over that fucking name. Princess Pina Colada, she sees absolute hell. She sees a war she cannot win. And when the napalm drops and they start seeing all this hell, essentially, the princess immediately wants to do a peace treaty with the Americans, which, I'll be honest, would make sense. It, it just works. It just works. Now, another thing about this story that I do love is that when the Japanese, when the JSDF and the Americans do meet face to face, it's a little tense at first, but it does kind of go about. And I do love the interactions between them, and of course the romance forming. Now, unlike the enclave thus we fought there, where the sole survivor just automatically has feelings for uh, Shino, the medic, it actually is more starts off as friendly and then evolves into the feelings. It's literally, this woman is a medic. She wants to be a medic first. She is a doctor first, soldier second. And that's exactly what it is because she did study post-traumatic stress disorder. She did study what the after effects of the Vietnam War had on the people. My own grandpa was a Vietnam vet and still had some episodes from when he was in Vietnam. Even though he wasn't the worst of them all, he still had some episodes. But mostly controlled them. And the way I see it, she sees this as sort of motherly, trying to help the American here, uh, John, to more or less mitigate some of the post-traumatic stuff that he saw, some of the, try and work through some of the feelings he may have bottled up. And I love it. That makes sense. That is good character development. And while, yes, I may shit on Enclave, therefore we fought there, even though it is no longer on Wattpad since the author took it down, the author has made it clear that he has no ill wills towards me and actually found me pretty funny and we're now pretty good friends. So yeah, moving on though, the other character is of course Kobayashi, who is the sergeant essentially and is the CQC specialist. And while being vastly different from her manga counterpart, still I do like that she's starting to get buddy-buddy with another one of the Americans from the 1960s. But that's when things get kind of downhill, at least in terms of politics. Because while the soldiers may be getting buddy-buddy, the higher echelons is not. Robbie Ken Bobby Kennedy is wanting to go over there, of course, to the other side to meet with the modern Japanese. And of course, you know, interact with the other world. Which I can already see happening is the Americans sort of being happy. Because here's the thing, folks. The Kennedys were loved by the American people. JFK and even RFK. Both the Kennedys were loved by the United States government, or by the U.S. people. And I mean that wholeheartedly. So when word will probably get back to America that a Kennedy, as in Robert Francis Kennedy, is coming over to the state, coming over to Japan to meet with them, I bet you anything, every single American who remembers Bobby Kennedy from back in the day, especially those who survived the 60s or grew up in the 60s, would probably get on a plane and start hauling ass over to Japan to try and meet the former U.S. president who was assassinated back in the 60s. Or maybe the 70s. I can't remember when Bobby got into office, but I do know that Bobby Kennedy did get into office and sadly was assassinated. But the big thing about it is that the Germans who did flee into the gate, as I said before, they get contacted by, of course, Himmler, Heinrich Himmler his little butcher, essentially, and tells them that they will be conducting insurgencies against the U.S. and the Japanese. And this happens when a bomb goes off in Italica. And while the Japanese, from a modern-day perspective, and this is what I love about it, is the two different types of military doctrines that are put into play. During the 1960s, when a bombing happens, we would occupy the area to stamp out the insurgency. Modern-day, when a bombing happens, we have to tread carefully now in terms of politics because of how connected our world is and essentially be very careful of how we interact with the locals, how we interact with the government. But with Italica, because the 101st and the Americans saved them from the brigands and of course, as they call it, the fire-breathing men in gray, they love the Americans. And I can already see essentially the American culture being adopted by the Italicans. And yes, Italicans. I can see an advisor coming to uh, the Countess to sort of help her out in terms of not only understanding politics, but also helping govern her city better, as well as create a sort of uh, defense force, or at least a, a better well-trained militia. Something kind of similar to what happens in 
uh, the fight we chose. Uh, but again, just one of those things, one of those things. <laughs> now, this does sort of lead into some tensions between the Ameri between the 1960s America and modern day Japan, or at least modern day in terms of the mid 20 teens or early 20 teens. The Japanese are wholly against the Americans occupying Italica. However, the Americans, ba even Robbie Ken Bobby Kennedy, uh, basically says that he wants to do this to make sure that fascism does not infect these people. To defend... Well, if I was going to say anything else, I'm just going to go ahead and use the clip I did before in the, uh, well, in the last review. That we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. These are a Kennedy's, ladies and gentlemen. The Kennedys love democracy. They love liberty. They love freedom. And they're going to make damn well sure that it's going to be stayed and retained. And the lore in the world itself, the world building, is amazing. I love it. I legit want to know more about this world, much like the fight we chose and how it's going to evolve after chapter 10. This one, like I said, is short, but it's enjoyable and can be binged. I was able to binge it within two hours, give or take, reading on and off and on, but it's still enjoyable. It's still fun. And the author himself does have a Discord, so I will link that down below as well. And... Well, all I can say is, the only real downsides I have to the story is that just a few grammar errors here and there, with some words being misspelled, or some words need to be replaced with other words, some things here and there. Again, just minor stuff. The story overall is fun, the story overall is good, and where we're at right now in the story, in terms of the current read, and yes, minor spoilers, is the otherworldly guest and of course the Japanese are now in our side. They're now stateside. They're in New York at the moment. They'll be making their way to DC and then of course California. However, the big thing about this is that the Germans, the Nazis, the SS, the Wehrmacht essentially are trying to capture these otherworldly guests because they fit the quote-unquote Aryan race and try and, I can only guess, capture them, bring them over and uh, attempt to brainwash them or convince them to come to their side. Again, there are a lot of cool things that I did say in the fight we chose would be incorporated into an idea like the whole uh, concept of using magic in modern warfare or at least uh, incorporating some magic into combat units. This story is going to fall is going to do that actually. They've stated that the CIA is interested in this. And unlike JFK, which immediately said, I don't want no kids on the front lines, here, Bobby basically says that's a good idea. Big stark differences between JFK and Bia and, uh, well, RFK, essentially. And as much as I know a lot of people are going to nitpick this story and basically try and point stuff out that doesn't make sense, it doesn't need to so long as it's entertaining and actually has a coherent story. And this does have a coherent story. It's entertaining. It is fun. I could actually see myself, when the story starts getting to a point, I could see myself sitting down, drinking on some Mike's Hard Lemonade, maybe munching on some Doritos, just enjoying the hell out of the story. It's a story you basically plop down on a couch for and you just binge read and you just relax while listening to some Vietnam music. Speaking of which, the Vietnam music is actually done much like Wombag, Wombat, or another uh, author who actually incorporates music into his story. Much like his story of uh, Rose Over a Shallow Grave and, of course, uh, Thus the Bear Went West. Or the one where the Pacific States of America, i.e. the PSA of Kaiserreich, uh, goes through the gate. And they, in, the author incorporates music very well, and I've tried incorporating music into my stories, much like he does. And the author here does the same. He even names titles of each chapter after a song or certain nice little slang from the 1960s. And I love that. This is a story that is just downright fun. It's not Platoon, it's not Apocalypse Now, it is an enjoyable Vietnam just action flick that you can turn off your brain and you can enjoy. It's not meant to be, it's not meant to be taken seriously in my mind, it's just pulp fun. 
It's like those exploitation films back in the day. Again, it's fun, it's great, and I highly recommend you guys go read it. Link down below to the actual story itself on fanfiction.net, and I want to thank Captain Rex for actually suggesting this little fanfiction to review. Thank you, Captain Rex, and for anyone else out there who has a uh, story to suggest, I will be getting to them after next time in America Month, where we travel to the Mach Imperium and take a look at America and Other World chapters 46 to 50. Now, if you excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, I have an expedition to plan for and ammunition to carry and weapons to acquire for my expedition to the Mach Imperium. God help me, ladies and gentlemen. God help me. And if you guys like what we do, consider supporting us via our PayPal down below. YouTube does actively demonetize videos if it doesn't match their Big Brother requirements, so you guys donating actually helps support the channel here and there. And if you want to help out with future videos, consider sharing, liking, subscribing, disliking, hitting the notification bell, and all that happy horseshit. Because YouTube says 80% of you people aren't even subscribed. So please, do consider subscribing today and uh, help us reach almost 3,000 subscribers. I'm not joking on that, we're almost at 3K at the recording of this video, and we just got to keep going for that number, ladies and gentlemen. As always, I've been Airsoft Al. Thank you for watching. And I will see you all in the next video of America Month. Till next time.